You're listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Delighted to have two experts here, uh, Dr. Ivy Lynn Bourgeau and Dr. Colleen Flood, who have taken time out of their busy day to give us a sort of bird's eye view of what it's like to actually work as experts uh, with Evidence Network. So I'm just going to turn it over to them, and they're going to give us an overview. Go for it. Sounds great. Uh, well, thank you so much um, for the invitation. This is really quite timely because I um, came from a conference uh, presenting on qualitative health research uh, where they had, they had asked me to present some work about engaging in different publics, and so I was able to use you know, some of the, uh, the tips and tools uh, that I've benefited from. Uh, from Evidence Network, so um, again, it's very timely. But I just want to kind of go just a little bit of a brief background just to kind of situate the type of expert um, that I am, and I always uh, find that um, kind of a little awkward. Um, uh, I'll talk a bit about the type of um, Evidence Network output that I've uh, participated in, and uh, it will be very much dovetailing with uh, Shen's presentation. Uh, and how I've used um, Evidence Network products um, in my teaching um, as well, and I do want to conclude with a, a little note um, about gender. Um, so I'm here at the University of Ottawa. I'm a professor in the Calvert School of Management. I'm a bit of an odd kind of person uh, to have at a school of management. We have a health systems program and a, a health administration program, uh, so that's where um, I mainly situate. I'm a social scientist. Um, I've had, thanks to uh, wonderful support uh, from my colleague, uh, colleague, had a chair in uh, Health Human Resources, one of the um, high health decisions. And through that, um, uh, began to lead a network, uh, the Pan Canadian Health Human Resources Network. Um, and I now hold a chair, uh, a gender work in health chair, which is specifically focused on uh, gender work in health human resources or about the health workforce um, in general. And um, I, I mentioned those because the health workforce is something so pervasive, it's like gender, um, but it's so invisible um, at the same time. So my engagement with Evidence Network has been that these are not sort of the most topical issues. I mean, there have been some, but um, uh, health workforce is not sort of the emergency issue, but it's just like a really critically important pillar um, of the health system that, you know, it has been difficult to try to raise the profile of. So partnering with Evidence Network has been really, um, has been really helpful about that. Um, so as you noted uh, from the outset, there are two different types of ways, or more actually, two different types of ways that Evidence Network um, works. So they're pushing out in terms of op-eds, and so they work with us uh, experts to create op-eds, um, but also to respond to media poll, and they've developed some really helpful tools and resources for how do we um, do um, each of those things. Um, but they have modified, so there are the um, evidence network interviews, posters, um, you know, to get sort of pithy things out, and and the posters are very um, similar to the memes, um, and so they do have that type of uh, that type of um, uh, orientation. So the first op, um, op-ed that I did, and, and the way that this usually happens is um, Kathleen approaches us. Uh, there may be something happening, maybe the minister's in meeting, maybe um, an issue is coming up, um, or maybe it's a slow time, and if it's a slow time, I will prepare some op-eds, you know, and, and she does give us, you know, um, some head time, some lead time um, to do that. So the first one I did with my colleague, uh, more fair, um, who's done work in uh, the health workforce field for a, for a long time. Um, and we did a piece, um, and this is using uh, Morris's term, um, healthcare's biggest soap opera. He said because characters, um, you know, are, are different, but the character types are the same, and it's the same plot over and over and over again when you're looking at health workforce. And in fact, we were at a, um, a round table where we were to talk to students and encourage students you know, to do health workforce research. And he said, yeah, health workforce issues is great. You could take a paper that you wrote five, ten years ago, you could polish it off, and you could republish it again, and it's still relevant. That is how things <laughs> never change. And so, he, so we made this comment about, uh, in this op-ed, making the case that we need to have a much more concentrated, explicit focus on this pillar of the healthcare system. Otherwise, we would just continue um, to have this um, soap opera. 
So this was something uh, that we did for the Hill Times, and um, as Shannon had uh, noted, this was reprinted, Huffington Post, a reminder, take County Record, Fox News Times, Miramichi Leader, and so it got out to bread and to places, and it was so really nice to have Evidence Network. I didn't follow that. They just kept on saying, oh, it got republished, and so I was able to pull that together. Um, and it's very nice because it's also um, on, the, on the archive of the Evidence Network um, website. I also did a piece, and so this is around, um, you know, the Premier is getting uh, together, so this is in, in 2012, so they're talking about sort of health innovation, and again, we wanted to kind of take what we had started with this original op-ed and, and frame it for this is something. If you're talking about innovation, so how do we work innovatively with the health workforce? How do we make that um, a case? And so that, um, that came out uh, around about the same time. Uh, at the premium meeting, and um, it had a very interesting response. So people picked up on it. So assistant deputy ministers that we had been working with, um, because what we were trying to do was to both say, here is an opportunity. Um, we wanted, we wanted to say, we want you to focus on this. And what was interesting is that some of these issues that we worked with um, were, <coughs> well, we are working on this, and so they were a little bit concerned about how critical um, we were um, in that case, or I was, because it was just a solo piece that I did at that point. Um, so that was two things. Number one, you know, we hit a nerve, um, and we knew that they were reading it. Um, but it did have a little bit of a backlash for us, because they were, they were asking us, you know, with this network that we had led, what is it exactly that you see yourself doing? Are you just pro providing us with evidence, or are you going to be criticizing us? And I'm going, well, you're in academia, and I think we're going to do a little bit of both. Um, so, you're very to develop a thick skin, please. Um, and so, I had um, sort of retreated a little bit because of the little bit of a negative um, impact that we had um, with that. Um, but then came around to, there was a, uh, I was asked to do a presentation around mimicry um, in Canada. And so, if you want to think about a really invisible issue, that's mm -hmm. mimicry in Canada. Um, and it was a piece that, and it was in part one that I kind of pitched. Um, but I was initially contacted by um, some of the midwives because they were having a meeting and they said, we really like the presentation that you did in Regina, Saskatchewan. They were having their meeting in Saskatoon. Could you write an op-ed that, that was similar to that? And then I said, well, I'll do that in partnership with Evidence Network. Um, and so it was about why do we have so few midwives um, in Canada? And this was something originally published in the Saskatoon Star Phoenix because, again, it was around that town meeting. And then it came out. And what was very interesting, it, it ended up being rated because it had such a far reach. Uh, ended up being rated as one of the top ten op-eds from that, uh, Network in, in, in 2014. It was uh, translated into French, and then it had a really good run um, in the French media. And um, what was also very interesting is around about that time, um, I can't remember the exact uh, chronology, but I was asked um, to, to do a piece on uh, white coat black art um, on this, and that is also archived there, the have and have not in terms of different in Canada. Um, and in case that you don't know, um, we have roughly 1,200 midwives. I say roughly because some of them are working part time, many of them are women, having babies, and that sort of thing. Um, we have like one tenth the number of midwives that they do. Um, in the UK, and the UK is considered to be um, in a shortage. Um, but you know, you can talk to me at the break about that. <laughs> um, and uh, so that I think was a really, a really great example of a sort of different spin off. Um, <coughs> so we were contacted. Help, uh, Hill Times often does a piece, you know, with, uh, you know, an insert that they're going to be doing. And uh, this one was on the New Health Accords around about the time. Uh, that the minister was going to be engaging in the provinces around that, and so we also, again, you know, made the pitch, you know, for some type of concerted, concentrated, explicit effort um, on the health workforce, and tried to kind of link it to you know, the policy issues in terms of mental health, home care, um, et cetera. And so that was um, another piece that, that came out. I should have also mentioned uh, the piece that I did on on midwifery. Um, also came out in the in the Ottawa Citizen, and uh, and then my then uh, president of the university contacted me and thanked me, you know, for engaging 
um, in the public. So there is recognition from the universities. So universities move at a glacial pace because they are medieval institutions. <laughs> and so we still have to publish, you know, in the primary journals, and it's all becoming very quantified in terms of our age score, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but there is recognition of this more so than uh, than, than initially. <clears throat> Um, I also brought on um, a student that was working with me and the Evidence Network family, and we did a piece on, uh, if we talk about sort of aging of the population, the health workforce is also aging, so there are different factors, and so how is it that um, we are um, going to create um, a health workforce to meet um, our aging population? So that was another piece that was, came out uh, just last year in the Hill Times, and was, um, so the last have all been uh, published in French, which is, which is great. And so that got linked into other evidence network um, products, these audio podcasts. So how do we change the health workforce for our aging population? So that was a really nice piece that came on. So it was very, very much in an interview style, download podcast. Um, another one was to rethinking long-term care for seniors in Canada, where I was one of several, several of the evidence network experts on interviews. And also one about, you know, is senior care going to break the bank? Well, it depends on how you do that. Um, and then they produced some really um, nice uh, nice posters that looked um, like names with my face on it, which is <laughs> some of them a little bit more off-putting um, than others. But the one that, um, uh, and it gets retweeted, and so even though we've done these um, about a year ago, it does come come back, you know, kind of hot sometimes, um, particularly with your face on it. But the one that I really liked is the quote that they took is that uh, from, from my words, you can't just wave a magic wand and suddenly have everything in the health system delivered by home care without there being explicit consideration about who is actually going to be doing that. And so it's making the case for any time you have a health policy, you really need to appreciate and understand and explicitly engage in the health workforce to know what are the health workforce implications. So if we're going to have a mental health policy, if we're going to have a home home care policy. So those have been uh, have been very nice. And another one that, that they did, which is one of one of my favorites, the architecture of our healthcare system was created in the 1960s, but we've had a demographic shift that's reversed since. And our healthcare needs and our health workforce needs to, to meet uh, those, those changing needs. Um, also, in part through my participation with um, Evidence Network, I get contacted. Uh, by the media to uh, respond to particular issues. Um, I have to say that has been a little bit more frustrating <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times that I'm contacted about, you know, a doctor being unemployed or a medical student not matching, and that makes news. And every time I respond to that, I'm going, are you going to talk to me about how few midwives that we have or how nurses are, are being treated with violence? I mean, there are many really important health workforce issues that don't make it to the media, but I have to say, I was looking back and I'm going, well, pretty much four out of the five types of things that I'm doing has been responding to physician workforce issues. And we certainly have more than just physicians um, in the health workforce. So some of these are on, are on radio, some of them are in print, um, some of them, uh, you know, are, you know, they give you a little bit more time. But it was very interesting to present about the, how do you respond to an interview. Do it right away. Right? When people are contacted uh, by the media, they often have to get something in either that afternoon. Sometimes you have a little bit of lead time. So you do kind of have to drop things, which can be difficult mm -hmm. in an academic environment which doesn't operate uh, for stuff. So um, on the Evidence Network website, uh, and I've utilized these and I've sent students to them and I've presented at the conference and walked through those lists, how to respond um, to interviews, what are some of the best practices how to speak in short sentences, writing down your notes, having three main points that you want to get across, and finding three different ways to say those three different <laughs> points to make sure that they get the quote that you want, but to develop a relationship um, with uh, different people in the media um, so that when they have a, a, a low point, um, you want to do that. So don't treat it as, as just a one-off. So those have been some very, very helpful hints. Um, also really helpful hints about op-eds and how to structure those. And it's so very similar, interesting because um, writing an op-ed is like writing a good story. It's like writing a good policy brief. There are, I mean, the, the elements of the recipe are very similar across those. 
Um, and then I've used those in courses and, uh, um, and for students and presentations. The other products that Evidence Network pulls together are the e-books. Um, which have been great. And so you get your you know, little piece in the collection of all of the different um, members of Evidence Network. And I've used that for my health policy class, my health care Canada class. Um, they're very easily digestible pieces. Um, if we don't assign the readings in class, I still have it as, you know, please refer to this, whatever paper um, you are going to be doing. And it's very topical, it's readable, they're short, they're absolutely perfect um, for classes. And I use them as examples because I get students to write in this way. I get them to write an op-ed, to write a policy brief on you know, the issues that, uh, that they're talking about. And I just have a note here to uh, mention um, social media because we've um, started engaging in that, not so much Facebook, but Twitter. Um, and uh, although my daughter now works for Facebook Europe, and so I think I have to <laughs> go there, um, you know, uh, to to get our work out. Um, but it has been it has been great to see the longevity of these issues. You know, they repost from the archive, it initiates the conversation again, and you never um, know where this stuff is going to go. It really is very interesting. So that has been another really um, good form good form of engagement. So um, I didn't put up PowerPoint slides, but I think in PowerPoint, so that's why my notes are. <laughs> I just wanted to, um, my last uh, note just before concluding, uh, was to make a case about gender. And if any of you follow me, you know that my byline is gender always matters. Even if there isn't a gender difference, it still makes a difference. Um, and that has been very important, that evidence network, and perhaps that has been an explicit agenda of, uh, of norms but um, I went through and counted up um, our experts, and we have nearly 50-50. Now, I haven't gone through all of the outputs, because that would just simply be too much, and I might actually encourage you to do that. Um, but the output that, um, as a female academic, I feel that I have a voice. And sometimes, you know, when you get caught in your academic ivory tone and all the stuff that you need to do, and having somebody say, oh, you know, there's some time to do an op-ed, and I realize, oh, okay, I haven't done one in a while. What, you know, would be something that I could do? Because um, I also do participate in uh, informed opinions, which is about getting women's voices out there, and I see these as two very um, uh, copacetic um, organizations, so I'm quite happy to participate um, in, in, in both. And some of the data that they have is that you know, men, are, in terms of being quoted in the media, it's almost like an 80-20. And so Evidence Network has really been ahead of the curve. Uh, in terms of that, so I think it's been it's been very supportive um, to getting them. So um, being a part of Evidence Network has, has been personally very rewarding, professionally uh, very rewarding. It's helped me engage in different forms um, of public. Um, it's both in terms of the quality of what and the quantity. Um, so I think that's really important. But more importantly, it gets the topic that I'm studying and that I'm really interested in um, out there and having a conversation about it. So it's been helpful for me personally, but it's <coughs> really great to get those a conversation about, about these topics because that can be very frustrating when you're doing research on an issue, which, you know, is akin to wallpaper. Um, so, uh, so I want to thank Evidence Networks and thanks for the opportunity to uh, present that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Evidence Network as well, uh, Nora Lou for starting it, and uh, Shannon and Katrina Grady. Um, I'm going to speak about it both as someone who writes as an expert, but also more from a kind of a policy perspective about why it's important. Um, not from my own so much. Um, so my background is uh, I am uh, a lawyer by training, but I, I focus on health policy issues. And particularly, I do work around um, how different healthcare systems function, and particularly the legal governance of healthcare systems. So the impact of something like the Canada Health Act on the services that we receive, the quality, the safety, accessibility, and compare that as a lot of comparative work. So 
my home country to New Zealand has, you know, as an immigrant, you're kind of always thinking about other places and other spaces and why do we have differences in some things that seem so obvious um, and yet don't happen here or happen here but don't happen here. So I tend to come at it from that thing. That's my sort of expertise, if you wish. But also I have dipped in and out of academia and doing other things. Uh, so Ivy mentioned her CIHR chair in gender. So for a while I was a scientific director at CIHR. And I spent a lot of time wondering about um, well, health services and policy research. And I spent a lot of time wondering about the production of knowledge and, and research uh, by the ivory tower. You know, there is an awful lot that happens there and a huge amount of investment, and we always want to know blah, blah, blah. But there is a gap, uh, which most of you know about, between that production, the ivory tower production, and the uptake uh, into policy, or well, not necessarily the uptake, but consideration, or is that they even know about it by policy makers, uh, by the media themselves, because the media may not know about it. And increasingly, of course, the concern is by the public, because the politicians are listening to what the public says or what they think they feel on any particular topic before they make a move. So all of these things are being linked up. So I, I think about it from that perspective um, as well. Right, so that translation from uh, of knowledge, of research, and the billions of dollars of investment that we make into people like Ivy and me and the flotilla of PhD students and master students and little undergrad bunnies behind <laughs> us, and then um, actually getting that information, that evidence, into the hands of people that we ultimately hope will at least consider it, if, even if the real politic of the day is they can't rely upon it, right? So, so that's how I um, come about it. And I think that this problem has been a problem that we've been talking about since you know, the days of Jonathan Moment and uh, the precursor of this great institution. Um, but I should say that I think this problem is even more of a challenge uh, because of the uh, growing uh, web of uh, communication channels. So it was once, you know, as you know, the story goes, we'd all sit down together and watch the evening news. Yeah. In New Zealand, we had actually one channel where I grew up, which is in the middle of nowhere in the north of New Zealand, actually one channel. So <laughs> you watch that, uh, and uh, but of course, um, uh, and one newspaper. But now, um, you know, it's not that newspapers aren't important, but we, we have many, many different channels of communication. And that is both glorious in that there are room for multiple voices and multiple perspectives. This is fantastic in so many ways. But it's also terrible. It's terrible because we can just listen to ourselves in this great kind of echo chamber. We can just listen to people that support our own biases, our own opinions, the anti-vaxxers are all on there particular channel, the we should privatize Medicare, they're all talking to their particular people, the people that I've been over ourselves on Facebook, but nobody listens to us. Apart right? <laughs> from our children who are like, oh you're so boring. Uh, so this is right, so this is the trouble of this kind of internal echo chamber. So unless we are actually percolating down into all of these um, means of media communication, all of the social media communication, all of these social networks, we, if we're producing evidence and we're trying to cross this divide, it's no longer just about trying to get into the room with the minister. Uh, because the minister is also going to be listening to everything that's coming through the various media uh, communication pipeline. So the challenge is even more significant, and that's where I find that evidence network has been brilliant in helping cross that divide. Um, and um, so let me also just say, um, just being a bit of talk here today about the fact, I should also mention that for my various terms of admission and commission, these days I'm acting as the Associate Vice President of Research at the University of Ottawa. So I'm really inside the bowels of this opportunity these days, <laughs> um, which is also, it's a lot of fun. But 
um, I can tell you and uh, that I do not believe that universities truly uh, are engaged in this issue of crossing the divide. They talk the talk, but they don't do the They don't actually provide any incentives or really any time. Um, they're, they're pleased if people like Ivy and I do something that you know they can put on an alumni request for money. <laughs> Right. They want a couple of these examples to use, but they don't really consider it at times as promotion or tenure. You do not get any leave from your myriad other responsibilities of teaching, applying for research grants, because research is not really as important as applying for research grants, and um, administration. Right. There's no real time, you know, and increasingly we are asked to do more and more as academics. And so because of that, um, you know, as an academic, I would say that most of us might think it would be a good thing, a cool thing, a nice thing to write an op-ed from time to time. But one would be enough. And then, you know, it's a Herculean effort to do that on top of everything yeah. else. And then, you know, if I'd be praised, we get it into the Globe and Mail, then my job is done, pick on my first CV, wait again for another year. Meanwhile, I'm publishing in, you know, the, the most fantastic Oswald Hall Law Journal, which you probably never had to read, or the Queen's Law Journal, because I don't even publish in the health policy because my discipline doesn't really value that as much. I do a bit, but they value legal journals, which you guys will never read. <laughs> Maybe if I tweet it out, you might go look, but then again, it's behind us, you know, some sort of paper or all that kind of thing. So there are a lot of barriers for academics get their information out. So the brilliance of Evidence Network is that if I, you know, go to that work of writing the op-ed, they will take it and they will transfigure it. Um, first of all, they'll do their magic of taking the words that academics like to use, <laughs> which are about impressing each other with their intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and, and the result of this is it's usually unintelligible. Right? So they're, they've impressed us with their intelligence, but it's unintelligible to most people. Kathleen will gently um, turn this into language that most people can understand. Um, some people, as was mentioned, have this ability, but most academics don't. And they will write this and extremely pointed letters, difficult, <laughs> opaque sort of a stuff. And there are there's gems of important stuff in there, but it's just hard to understand. Kathleen will turn it around, and, and in doing that, she trains them how to write this in better ways as well, which is a very good thing. But then the brilliance is, the true brilliance is that having put it into one place, um, she will then take it and get it into, you know, in my case, 13, 14, 15 other places, which I would never have the time, energy, or fortitude to do. I, I am just too busy with a myriad other things, and I don't get enough brownie points for doing that. Right. So um, this morning, uh, someone sent me like a list of some of the places that the things have gone. I'm just going to read out like some of them: Ottawa Live, Battleford News, Optimist, Huffington Post, Policy Options, Canadian Healthcare Network, Winnipeg Free <coughs> Press. This is just mine. By Politics, Huffington Post, Quebec. Professional Santé, Options Politics, Les Allows, Waterloo Region Region Record, Canadian Healthcare Network, Battleford News Optimist, Local Express, The Daily Glean of Fredericton, Whitehorse Daily Star, Saskatoon Star Phoenix, Windsor Star, CBC News, La Presse, Miramichi Leader, Weekly Voice, Troy Media, Clearwater Times, Global Mail, whatever, Lakeshore <laughs> News, <laughs> Uh, Riverside, Kelowna Daily Courier, Hamilton Spectator, Moscow Times and Transcript, Fox Free Times, The White Horse Daily Star, Alaska Highway News, Coronosh Triangle News, New Brunswick Telegraph Journal, Prince Albert Daily Herald, South West Booster, and I have another whole page. Seriously. Okay, so this is the kind of impact that means something because some little person who's not now reading the guy them out is going to find it pretty hard to miss my office <laughs> on why we should have national pharmacare and how ridiculous it is that a little country like New Zealand, where I'm from with 5 million people, can do this and this guy hasn't fallen 
kind of thing. Any evidence from there about how they do it? Um, they haven't washed away $5 billion worth of change at the same time and all these kind of things. So, so this is the sort of thing, I think, that is really wonderful. And then, of course, every time it comes out in a new venue, it's another opportunity to post on Twitter, to post on LinkedIn. You know, I actually need to do more of that like as it's coming out to post and repost because of course people dive into Twitter, like I, you know, I'm on Twitter um, at some point all the time and I'm just sick of it and I don't look at it again. So, you know, if stuff is being reposted, that's good because you kind of, you might catch it, right? And it's really a tactic as a resource for kind of research for a lot of people as well. And, and so I think that to me is um, the, the brilliance of Evidence Network and why um, I thoroughly support it, and uh, and in fact, um, we uh, we we essentially asked Kathleen through my uh, Center for Health Law Policy and Ethics to to do this work uh, for us uh, more directly, um, modeled on the on the evidence network as well. So um, so I just want to thank the evidence network again for all of the fantastic uh, leadership that works in this area. Uh, both personally and as a person who really cares about the bigger picture of uh, getting evidence into uh, the hands of people um, who might make uh, some difference with it. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today, uh, Eileen and, and Colleen. Um, when uh, I was talking to Kathleen about who we thought would be available, Kathleen said, well, you can try Eileen, you can try Colleen, but both of them are really, really busy. So mm -hmm. I don't know if they'll have the time, but I'm so pleased both of you were available. Uh, we'll do some uh, questions as well, take some questions as well from the floor. But thank you for reminding me, because we do have a new ebook coming out, and it's called Evidence Trump Fake News. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we use that. And apparently we, we put it out on the online and we get all sorts of trolls <laughs> going about Trump. So, well, we have to deal with that. That was kind of fun. That was a lot of fun uh, dealing with trolls. You know, you've made it if you've got trolls. Yeah. Yes, I know. Well, I, as, a, as a female who regularly wrote op-eds about abortion and uh, gun control at the Winnipeg Free Press, I was well used to trolls anyway. Um, I will take, we'll take questions from the floor if our, our experts, if anybody has any questions uh, that they'd like to ask uh, for our experts. We let you off easy, I think. Any questions? Oh, go ahead. Just because there are no questions, I'll ask. Just curious about it, and maybe this is a question for you, Janet. Um, are you are you obligated? Do you have a contract with the Evidence Network? Uh, do they? How often do they reach out to you? And uh, maybe uh, Shannon, if you could talk about how many experts you have. Or no, I'm curious about that. Yeah, no, uh, I don't have a contract. There isn't a requirement that I do any op-eds. I just sort of, you know, as you know, kind of a sense that I should do one a year and, and you know, other other things. Um, and particularly if I have, um, you know, a student and bringing students in to, um, to the, you know, the importance of op-eds and engaging and having this, uh, you know, shining on some of their research. Um, and sometimes we do that so it's not an either or. Um, so if I say, okay, something's going to be coming out in the Canadian Medical Association Journal or Canadian Family Physician, you know, we could we could do something around that so that whatever um, comes out, you know, there's sort of a spin-off of the academic um, publication as well. But there isn't a, a contract, it's just a notion. We're, I mean, there's an email that gets sent out to us and we either pick it up or don't pick it up depending on whether or not we have uh, the capacity. Yeah. Sometimes uh, we will push something to Jen and uh, Kathleen, so I would say I'm going to meet somebody um, there's a moment coming up where we have had have, have a day with uh, Steve Morgan who then uses uh, sort of central governance on national farm care, for example. So these kinds of moments, if you know that they're coming up, we might just say it's a really good time to get something in the media or um, you know, the recent uh, rigor model article about the BC research on vaccines. If I had more time, I've actually got a vaccine kind of I'll it in the hopper, and this would be a good time to, you know, re, re put it in the context of this and, and get it out there. So, 
you know, there are windows of opportunity, I think, that come up. And uh, you know, I think Kathleen and Shannon and, and the team are, are really great at uh, building that sort of network, right? Network with the media and then network with, uh, with the experts. But I think, you know, the idea is to keep the experts refreshed and not just have the same old, same old and so get, the, get new people's voices uh, out there. And uh, I also think it's really important that the, the network uh, be as, uh, you know, it's really got to be evidence-based. Um, you know, it obviously has a bit of a social justice kind of lens on it, but I think it is important to have, you know, when it's, when the evidence isn't in favor of that, then that has to be there as well. And I think they've actually been very committed to that, to have to be as impartial as, as possible. Here's the evidence, here's the research, um, and try to filter out people who try to write too much, you know, this is just my opinion, this is, this is the politics, you know, um, that kind of thing. So we wanted to inform politics, but not be political. Yeah, we were trying very hard to stay away from being like the Frontier Center or the CCPA. Uh, one of the kind of pet peeves that I had when I was the op-ed editor at the Winnipeg Free Press is any time anything came from the CCPA, I knew that what they were going to say. The NDP is wonderful, everybody else is garbage, right? And it's like, I, I don't want that kind of obvious tilt in anything that we put forward. I want it to be evidence-based and as apolitical as possible so that there is no obvious political reading that you can put on it. In terms of uh, experts, I think we have probably about uh, 60 that are listed on our website, but it changes and grows as time goes. The two people that are coming on, we have Tom McIntosh out of Regina that's just come on as our health policy researcher out of Regina at the Johnson Shoyanama School of uh, Public Policy. And he's a really dynamic uh, researcher that started with us as well. Uh, I just came out of a, a Prairie Political Science Association. I did a conference there in BAM. It is such a tough job sometimes having to do BAM conferences. <laughs> so I did how to write a how to write an op-ed, and I got about to. 10 new people that are actually interested in doing stuff that do political public policy that is evidence-based as well. So we're hoping to bring them in too in terms of the kind of the, the social the social policy uh, justice and the kind of justice thing too. And you know, and you you mentioned something too, like and I'm really glad you, you did that too. In terms of the Nagel report, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of criticism uh, of TRCs and research that has been dominated by you know, white men and, and, and the lack of diversity in voices of, of our research in Canada. And um, what, uh, what we can do at Evidence Network is provide a really kind of a safe space for uh, women, persons of color, indigenous persons, uh, to be able to start uh, the opportunity to, to write. Uh, as a person who has been I mean, when you are a, a, a public person, when you work for a newspaper, you are a public person. Uh, and I, like I say, I have had a fairly high media profile prior to that. It is really scary to have a microphone shoved in your face and to do the eight-second interview and then find out your six o'clock news, what they've done with it. But to have the opportunity to use the 800 and 750 words and frame it the way you want to, you have total control. It's a great way for women to actually get their voices out there. It's a great, safe way to start with their voices, as, and as well with uh, Indigenous people and people of color. And it's also a way for universities and research organizations then to, to actually give them an opportunity to have their voices heard. And it's also another way that, you know, we at, the, at the, the free press, we were constantly trying to find alternative voices other than the same three white guys that picked up the phone, frankly. And so it's a way of boosting alternative voices, of other voices that were available. And that's what Evidence Network is looking for. Yes? Um, I just questions came to me now, so I'm not sure if you're trying to wrap up. but. Um, Listening to you, you're kind of experts from a university institution where you have sort of that, I would say, independence. So some of us here, maybe I'll just speak for myself, myself I'm from an organization. So uh, arm's length, but federally funded organization. I have, I have experts, great experts in pharmaceutical policy and medical technology and all kinds of things. I'm just wondering where some, where those experts, like affiliated with an organization that might not be a university, how would they fit or how would you consider them at the Evidence Network? Um, 
That's a really good question. Uh, if they are doing research that is evidence-based, we would still consider them. And what your what evidence a network is interested in doing is with a smaller organization like that is doing a potentially a small memorandum of agreement that would allow you to get the evidence-based research that you're doing to push it out uh, through our evidence-based uh, evidence network. So if you have, uh, we've done something very similar with this uh, heart and stroke where we have a bunch of uh, researchers that are working on heart and stroke specific research that we're uh, using uh, with evidence networks to sort of get that public policy issue addressed specifically through evidence networks. Uh, Stephanie, did you want to want to maybe talk a little bit about what, what you're doing with us right now? Sure, and sorry, introduced myself last time, Stephanie Lawrence from Heart and Stroke. So we have um, a similar contract with uh, Evidence Network, as Shannon just described, and we we just uh, engage in that contract because we worked with them in the spring, um, just sort of on, a, on an ad hoc basis, and had terrific, terrific results. So we're obviously working on policy issues, as everybody is, but we were working on a couple of policy issues that are actually very hot right now, one being um, our food beverage marketing to kids. And that the bill was going through third reading at the the Senate committee, and we really, I mean, we've done a ton of media around it in the past year, like more media than we've ever gotten on any issue. But we wanted to elevate this bit, we actually wanted the decision makers to see it. So we did two offers. Um, I engaged a freelance writer, they were all evidence-based, because we have the evidence-based. 2006 was the first consensus statement. So these are long windows. And we had um, a researcher from Ottawa U who did a piece for us, Dr. Michelle Kent. And we also had another piece that was um, co byline to our VP of Research and also Dr. Thomas Shorty, who's a really well known pediatrician in BC. And we developed the pieces, Kathleen brilliantly edited them, they were all referenced, and then they were pushed out, and the results were incredible. So the, the first piece, I lent our VP and Dr. Wachorski went to the Globe and Mail first, and then I think it was 12 to 14 reprints. And then the second piece by Dr. Pashenkin, uh, we actually targeted the, the um, I think it was iPolitics or policy yeah. option, because we really wanted decision makers to see it. We'd actually done tons of the public already. We, you know, <coughs> as uh, legislation is being pushed forward now, we really need to focus on the decision makers, so we've entered into a contract, and we'll be doing some over the next year, really focusing on decision makers because those are the people that we need to see it now. This move is going to have to be what we, what we, we, The way we do it, or the way we think about it, is we're not spin doctors. I mean, Stephanie Lawrence, Heart and Stroke, knows how to do, knows how to do public relations. She doesn't need us in public relations. But we do need you, actually, because you have, you have um, Kathleen has the ins with the editors that we don't yeah, have, and none exactly. of the publicists have it. Yeah. Completely, you bring something so unique yeah. that we can't replicate. But we do it in a different way. Like, like Shouldn't have said, we're not spin doctors, we're not spin doctors in a traditional way. We, 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 oh, no, but yeah. we take stuff that, that is, is evidence-based from researchers that we then put out. So it's not, it's, so someone can't look at it and go, oh, it's from heart and stroke and dismiss it. They go, oh, it's from an Ottawa researcher talking about stuff that's important to heart and stroke, and it's not as, as easily dismissed, if you know what I mean. And, and I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. Yeah. So there are, there are two issues. There's one, um, from your perspective of your organization, do you have the, what we have, the academic freedom to say certain things? So that's one issue. Um, so I think partnering with somebody um, in the academic environment that allows that. Um, but I think working in partnership with, uh, with the different organizations, and I do that a lot. And, even though I, I very much appreciate the academic freedom that I have, I also want to be working with a variety of different stakeholder organizations, so sometimes I don't say things, just because I know that that's not going to play very well with one or the other stakeholder organization. Um, and so we do kind of self-censor uh, self -censor a little bit because you're in the health policy um, environment. Um, but I have worked with a lot of different um, professional associations on you know particular topics, but it's very helpful, for example, for the Canadian Association of Midwives for me to say things and not for them to say things, right? And they talk about you know having somebody else you know pull their horn for them instead of instead of them. Um, I mean, I work in the health workforce field, not being a health professional of any kind, which can be a disadvantage but can also be an advantage. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Did anyone else? That was you. Okay. Definitely. Um, 
So we're working right now on an op-ed uh, around Indigenous health. And actually, one of the questions I got, we haven't decided who's going to write it yet. We're having a couple of conversations. But one of the questions I got was, um, how does Evidence Network feel about non-traditional evidence? So in Aboriginal or Indigenous health, we're not going to have the you know, RCTs and the, the, the evidence that we might traditionally use. So how can we uh, develop an evidence-based op-ed from an Indigenous perspective in terms of Indigenous health? Well, and it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to think about that. Um, I, do, I do some work with Indigenous very much a relationship. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that I grew up between three Indigenous communities and I have some lived experience, um, that's, it's still not the same as me interacting with them as, you know, um, as an academic and the, uh, the, the power um, that one has is really sharing that. Um, I'm, I'm a mixed methodologist, but I largely do qualitative research, but I see how they interact. Um, you know, I, I abide by what we refer to as the golden rule of methodology, is that the methods follow the question that you ask. I just tend to ask qualitative types of questions. Um, and that is evidence, right? And social scientists are scientists as well, right? Um, and so I have a, a much broader um, sense of that. So um, evidence uh, comes from all different types of inquiry. Um, uh, indigenous forms of knowing, you know, who I've seen, as I talk about, is a form of evidence and inquiry. Um, and so I think that we need to uh, recognize that. I mean, ultimately, what science is the systematic way of, of uncovering knowledge, of knowing things. Um, and as long as you're systematic about it and recognize uh, your standpoint in it, um, I don't think people who do um, quantitative research do enough of that to say, you know, what their role is. Um, I read a brilliant piece um, of someone who wanted to look at the whole um, end of life um, uh, story and research on end of life and look at the people doing the research and how they framed the research and what their particular perspectives were on end of life, pro, con, mix, um, quantitative, qualitative research. So I think qualitative researchers have taken that on, recognizing what one stands but, but again, that's a whole other conversation, but I think there's lots of different forms of evidence required. Uh, I, would, um, I would recommend that uh, you look for an indigenous person, an indigenous researcher to, to write it. That would be the good thing to do. I think they probably stick out. They are looking for an, it, it, they might not be a researcher, though, but definitely an indigenous person will. They are indigenous researchers in health. Yep. Um, yeah. um, if possible, and uh, I think they thoroughly really stick about it. Um, and but I think this is a is a bigger issue, right? So the gold standards are and then you know sort of uh, you know they're like, what is legal research? You don't you don't even do research, do you? Just sort of go to court and chase ambulances. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know we all have um, our views on what's appropriate the standard of evidence research and uh, evidentiary requirements is, and I don't think it's just sort of indigenous research versus other research. It's a whole big debate about, you know, the value or not of qualitative kind of evidence and different kinds of approaches to quantitative kind of evidence. And so it really depends on the issue. Um, what is the appropriate standard of evidence that you're looking at? And I would say for, you know, matters that are uh, implicating of indigenous health, that indigenous approaches to research is, you know, as long as that is clear that this is the stance that we're taking that is completely legitimate. Um, I personally would also, you know, if there is uh, more uh, conventional, I guess, forms of, of evidence that would bear on the matter, that that would be included as well. Just looking at your website, there's evidence network on and there's dynamic evidence network. Not evidence network, are you not the same, not affiliated in any way? Uh, evidence network, not the same. Yeah. There's something called dot evidence network. Yes, I know. It's, uh, it's not the same. Not the same thing, no. Evidence network dot CA. Yeah. There was a bit of a fight about that one, too. <laughs> That's a good story. That's fine. And we are, by the way, updating our evidence network.ca website that's uh, right now we're transitioning it from the University of Manitoba to the University of Winnipeg. That was quite, <laughs> quite the endurance test, that one on its own. <laughs> Bureaucracy. 
<laughs> what a challenge. Uh, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you again to our experts for taking the time today. You've been listening to a podcast from evidencenetwork.ca, making evidence matter in Canadian health policy. Connect with the latest nonpartisan health research from experts across Canada and around the world, or sign up to receive our free monthly e-newsletter at www.evidencenetwork.ca. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Evidencenetwork.ca is funded by the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Research Manitoba, and the University of Winnipeg.